in the last discussion, I explained that preferences are subjective and that economics is objective in terms of it being a science. Let me just give another analogy for that just to make sure you follow it. There could be an FBI profiler of serial killers. And you know, there's, a, there's a crime scene in some city, Cincinnati or something. Oh man, there's this serial killer that keeps striking. And we've got five victims now that seem to be the same guy. And the police can't solve the problem. And they call the FBI and the FBI profiler comes in. And the FBI profiler goes to the scenes of the crime and looks at the situation. And what does the profiler have to do to be successful? He has to get inside the mind of the serial killer. He has to think like the serial killer does to understand the actions that the serial killer took. You know, he's got to say, well, gee, that, that's odd. He, uh, he apparently well, you bumped the table and knocked the vase over and then put it back where it was before he left the scene of the crime. I wonder, I wonder why he did that. What's going on in his mind that even though he's willing to kill somebody, he, he didn't want to leave the vase turned over, that that bothered him for some reason or whatever. Okay, so in going through all that, to be a good profiler, to do your job correctly, you can't be judging the serial killer, right? You have to get inside the mind of the serial killer and understand what the serial killer's goals or purposes are, what things the serial killer values. Obviously, the serial killer doesn't value the maintenance of human life. It's not that the serial killer is repulsed of the idea of, of uh, hurting somebody. That's clearly not important to the, this person, the, the serial killer. Oh, but other things are important to him. And so if you're going to be a profiler and your job is ultimately to, to try to catch this person or help catch this person to stop him, still, for you to do your job correctly in that one respect, you can say, I'm not here to judge the person's value system. I just need to understand what it is to connect it to the actions we've seen to help us ultimately get this person. You know, So it's not a great analogy, it's not a perfect analogy, but I'm just trying to get you to see the relationship there. That nobody, I hope, would say, oh, that's disgusting. You're trying to think like the serial killer, so you think it's okay to murder people? That's gross. What are you talking about? That's no, the profiler would say, well, no, of course not. I don't endorse what he's doing. I don't endorse his value system and the things that are important to him. But I need to, in order to understand the phenomenon here, I need to be able to admit that he does have a value system that's subjective, that's unique to him. And that that's the only way to make sense of what's going on here. Otherwise, it would just look like freak things all the time with no possible connection, no pattern. But once... I, I start to say, wait a minute, maybe there's a set of preferences that are odd, that are not normal compared to what most of us care about, that w are consistent with these things. Okay, so, again, not a, not a perfect analogy, but somewhat related in economics, we as economists to explain activity in the marketplace need to admit up front that there are people out there with subjective preferences and we don't judge them in the sense of we need to just see what they are to ex understand how they uh, manifest themselves in market activity. And that's the way we make sense of what happens in the marketplace. And in that respect, we're not judging them. But it doesn't mean as human beings or in terms of our moral or religious convictions or what we think is good for the flourishing of society, it doesn't mean we have to remain neutral with regard to other people's choices. It's just saying, as objective economists, to explain things, we have to be neutral in that respect, that limited respect. Okay, another principle is that, okay, we've got individuals, there have to be individuals, they have preferences, those preferences are subjective. The next thing I want to bring up is the type of preferences that we can deduce in this procedure that we're using here those preferences are what's called ordinal, not cardinal. And that's a, those are fancy mathematical terms. What I just mean is that preferences are a ranking from most preferred to second best preferred to third best preferred and so on, rather than a measurement of some magnitude of goodness. So the way to remember that distinction, and, and I bring up the distinction because if you go on into economics, you will encounter 
people t using this language. That some people will say, no, 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 preferences are ordinal, utility is ordinal, and that's why using cardinal utility functions doesn't make any sense, right? So economists have these arguments, so that's why I'm just I'm giving you this terminology just to help equip you in case you later on or already have encountered such disputes. But for our purposes in this class, uh, you, first of all, you, you remember that distinction, just the, the names we give to certain numbers. The ordinal numbers are things like first, second, third, eighth, twelfth, whereas the numbers that are cardinal are things like 3.74 and 1 and uh, 28.7, okay? So it makes sense you can uh, perform operations on cardinal numbers. You can say 8 plus 2 is 10, and you can say 8 is twice as big as 4. Whereas with ordinal numbers, you can't do that kind of thing. You can't say that second is twice as good as fourth. You see that? That that doesn't make any sense. So yes, you can rank things with ordinal numbers. You could say this is the first best, this is the second best, third best. But it's not as if talking like that implies there's really some kind of underlying unit of measurement and that the thing that's first best has the highest measurement of those units and the thing that's second best has the second highest amount and so on that you don't need to think like that just to be able to rank stuff. So let me just relate it to the economics and then I'll try to give you an analogy to make it more sensible for you. So with economics, remember, our decision to interpret something is the result of human action. We're seeing choices being made. People have preferences. And all we could ever really deduce from that is that they prefer something to the thing that they didn't choose. If I offer vanilla versus chocolate, and the person picks chocolate, what can I say? Oh, he preferred the chocolate to the vanilla. I can't say the chocolate gave him 16% more happiness than the vanilla. That it's, it's not just that, oh, how could you know? It's that the mere act of choice doesn't even lead us to believe that such talk is meaningful that by choosing, all you're doing is establishing that I preferred this over that. So it was a more versus less. It wasn't a, uh, this gave me more units of something than this thing did, and that's why I picked it. This discussion is going to make more sense to you when we get to the treatment of market prices under barter later in this course where we're going to go through and I'm going to show you if you have a bunch of kids who have different preference rankings over combinations of candy bars, I'm going to show you how we can just think through the logic of it and realize what the, what's going to be called the equilibrium prices are going to be in that little economy. So in case you're wondering, that, that's where we're going with this. I'm just trying to lay the foundation so you're thinking about it properly and I'm going to show you how much we can do just with these simple insights. But for right now, I just want to make sure you don't get confused that the type of preferences people have, they're just a ranking. And that's all we need. And that's all we can get from our insight that people are acting. So let me end this particular discussion with an analogy. Whenever you get confused and you're unsure, just think about friendship. In the years I've been teaching this stuff, that's the best analogy I can come up with. So economists, a lot of times, they refer to preferences the word they'll use is utility. And that's just like a fancy word for usefulness or importance that, oh, people will choose the thing that gives them the most utility. And so that's okay, but what I'm trying to guard you against is to say, don't think that utility is this substance, even if it's like a psychic substance that has units that are measurable and that the first best thing gives the most utility the most units of it, and the next best thing gives a, a lower number of units and, and so on. You don't need to think like that. And, and that, that confuses people sometimes, and so let's switch it to friendship. Just think about it in terms of friendship, and it should be crystal clear what my position is and what I'm trying to say to you is the right way to think about utility. With friendship, does it make sense to rank your friends? Sure. You could say, oh yeah, Sally's my best friend, John is my second best friend, and George is my third best friend. 
That's perfectly reasonable. That sounds normal in terms of everyday language. But what if I said, oh, so Sally gives you the most friendship units, huh? That doesn't make sense. That, that sounds funny. And what if I said, uh, Sally, does Sally give you 80% more friendship units than George or, or less than that? I know she gives you more friendship units because she's your best friend, but is the degree of her superior friendship, is it 80% higher or is it not that much higher? If you start talking like that, that's just nonsense. You'd say, no, I don't even know what you're talking about. It doesn't make sense to say how much more in percentage terms is Sally a better friend to me than George is. Okay, so it's not merely that you would say, well, you know, I don't really have a good yardstick for that and so I can't tell you, but I'm sure that that number makes sense. I just don't know what it is. No, it's that even talking like that doesn't make any sense. Even though it does make perfect sense to say, I can rank my friends and Sally's my best friend and John's my second best and George is my third, if, if that's what I said. Okay, so again, just to reiterate, that analogy with friendship will help you think about utility the, in the proper way. And in fact, I almost want to shy away from utility because it, it leads you to think that what's going on in the marketplace is that people are trying to maximize this the number of units of something called utility so that's why i would i prefer just calling it preferences but that word utility is all over the place in the rest of economics and so i if you're going to be taking this course i want you at least to, to be armed and know how other people talk about this stuff but just think about it in terms of a preference ranking and you'll be fine and it's okay to say that the top ranked thing gives me the most utility and the second ranked thing gives me less just like you could say I have the most friendship with Sally I have less friendship with John you know that's that's not terrible but that's really as far as you can push it if you start trying to get into more specifics about well how much how much less friendship do you have with John within Sally like in units that then you start running into serious trouble where you get into meaningless talk so it's the same thing with utility. At least the type of utility or preferences we can derive from our insight that people are acting out there. The last principle I want to go over in this lecture is that people's subjective preferences can in no way be combined or added and subtracted with each other. There's no way to take the individual subjective preferences of people in a given community, for example, and construct some sort of social preferences or social utility or total utility or total preferences, that kind of talk is meaningless. Again, if we're using preferences in the way that we can deduce logically from the action axiom or the initial decision on our part of social sciences to interpret a scene as being evidence or, or being an illustration of action at work, the type of preferences that, that pop out of that decision on our part cannot be manipulated arithmetically with other preferences associated with different individuals. So the specific, and, and I think that follows naturally from the previous discussion where we were talking about preferences being uh, a ranking ordinal in nature if you are comfortable using that term as opposed to cardinal once you realize that, there's, you, it, it jumps out. You can't add them together or subtract them or combine them in any way. That To say that this is the third best thing and that over there is the fourth best thing, you can't add those two together and say, well, together, what would they be? I mean, they certainly wouldn't be the seventh best thing. That goes the wrong way, right? But if, you t if, you had the, if something by itself is the third best and something else by itself is the fourth best and then you had them together, what... You can't say, oh, well, then that would be second best. Or first. That doesn't, there's no way you can do that. Whereas if you had something that weighed three pounds and something over here that weighed five pounds, and you said, what are they when you add them together? Well, then they weigh eight pounds. Because weight is a cardinal objective property of objects in the world, and you can take those kinds of properties and add them or subtract them or what have you. But with preferences, it's a subjective ordinal ranking and it doesn't make sense to try to add them up like that. So if it doesn't even make sense with a given individual to try to do arithmetical operations on preference rankings, well then all the more so is it crazy talk 
to try to do that among individuals. Right, so even with John, if you say John's first choice is chocolate ice cream and his third choice is strawberry, what if we gave him chocolate and strawberry at the same time? How would he rank that? There's no way you can just take those numbers and, and do something with that. You have no idea. What would really be crazy is to say John's first choice is strawberry or when I say chocolate and Mary's third choice is strawberry. What would it be if we added those two things together? Now it really is meaningless that you're taking ordinal preference rankings from different people and somehow trying to combine them mathematically. That really makes no sense. Now, the reason I'm stressing this is that you'll find a lot of people trying to appeal to economics to justify what's called uh, redistribution of income. And so let me just give you very quickly what their argument is, just so you understand why I'm stressing this particular point, which might seem obvious to you. So. There's something we're gonna learn in the next lecture with Robinson Crusoe economics that's called diminishing marginal utility. And the idea there is for a given person, the more units he or she gets of a certain good, the less important each subsequent unit is. And so the way economists typically describe that is to say there's diminishing marginal utility, which just means on the margin, you know, on the edge, each additional unit you give me I ascribe less and less utility to that. It's less important to me. It's lower in my value rankings than the earlier units. And so, loosely speaking, one way to, to illustrate that principle is to say something like, oh, well, for Bill Gates, that billionth dollar that he has in his possession is far less important to him than the first dollar he had. Because the earlier dollars he devotes to really important things like getting food and basic shelter and so on. But by the time he's already a billionaire, getting more and more units of money isn't very important to him. Uh, and also, Bill Gates doesn't actually keep all of his wealth in the form of dollar bills, but let's not worry about that right now. I'm just trying to get you to see the basic point here about diminishing margin utility. Whereas, uh, okay, so that's, that's the principle, and that's true. And the same thing would be true of a homeless guy who doesn't have very much money at all. Maybe he's just got like a dollar in his pocket. It would also be true to say of him, the principle of diminishing margin utility says that dollar in his pocket right now is far more important to that homeless guy than would be the billionth dollar if we just kept giving him more and more dollars and now he, you know, to give him the billionth one. So that's true. But then people jump from those two true statements about Bill Gates and the homeless guy to say, if we took Bill Gates' billionth dollar and gave it to this homeless guy so it was his second dollar, then we would increase total utility because Bill Gates doesn't ascribe much utility to that billionth dollar, but the homeless guy really ascribes a lot of utility to that second dollar. And so clearly, yeah, Bill Gates is made worse. We take away one of his dollars, but the homeless guy's gain more than offsets that. And so by doing this transfer, we've increased the total utility in society. And so that's why it's a good idea. Right, so people will talk like that. And so what I'm saying is, regardless of the, the justice you might think about that, whether you think it's a good idea to try to take from richer people and give to poorer people, that that's noble, or whether you think that, no, that's stealing. Okay, so you can have opinions as to the legality or the justice or the fairness of it, that's fine. But what I'm saying is, the economic argument used to justify it is completely illegitimate. That at least in terms of the preferences we've been talking about in this lecture, that you cannot compare utility or preferences between different people. That it's just nonsense. It's not that it's wrong, it's that it's nonsense. That it doesn't even mean anything. It would be like saying Bill Gates' height uh, is greener than the homeless guy's intelligence, right? It's, it's not even just that that statement is false. It's like, that doesn't, what, what does that even mean? And by the same token, if you understand the way preference and utility works that we've been building up in this lecture, to say the dollar, the billionth dollar to Bill Gates gives him less utility than it would give as a second dollar to this homeless guy, it's not just that that might be a false statement, it's that it's meaningless. It's like saying Bill Gates' height is greener than the homeless guy's intelligence. What does that even mean? Okay, so in summary, we've just walked through now various principles that we can deduce about reality 
from our initial decision to say that we're going to look at the world and interpret it as being evidence of action, or we're going to see action at work, notice all the things we deduced in this lecture, that there are individuals, there are other minds at work out there beyond my own mind. They have preferences or goals. Those goals are subjective. Those goals are a ranking, not a, not a measurement of some cardinal substance. And finally, those subjective rankings or preferences or uh, statements about utility or facts about utility that are unique to each individual, there's no way we can take those things and combine them into statements about social utility or social rankings or social preferences. That that is a completely illegitimate move that misunderstands what we've been developing. And the final thing I want to say is just reflect back on what we did here. Although I was using specific examples of things you've seen in your daily life to illustrate these principles, I developed them just by thinking through the implications of action. And so that's why I hope you see the appropriate analogy for what we're doing in this course as we build upon these principles and build up more and more uh, economic principles or results that will surprise you if you've never seen them before, that's much more analogous to what goes on in geometry than to what goes on in physics. And we as economists don't need to apologize for that. That that's uh, just because the nature of what we're doing is different from what they're doing in physics or chemistry. Just like the mathematicians don't need to apologize for the way they construct their proofs in their field. That that's very appropriate for the type of knowledge they're giving to other humans by their work. By the same token, what we economists are doing with our thinking through the logical implications of choice and what's going to be called scarcity and other, th other terms you'll learn in the next lecture, we don't need to apologize for the fact that we come to the table armed with those things before we look out at the world and parse reality. Just like the mathematicians already know the Pythagorean theorem is true before they then look at what their sensory data tells them. One last thing I should say in, uh, as a final statement on this whole lecture, I just want to warn you many economists would actually say that what I'm talking about here uh, only applies to sort of core economic logic and that if you want to then say more sophisticated things or, or harder things like well what caused the housing bubble or or why are there recessions, or what causes certain things in the economy, and they might say, well, those are empirical questions, and there you do need to use the methods of the physicists or the chemists. So that's a separate argument, a more sophisticated argument, and I, but I don't want to get into that right now. What I'm saying is the stuff we're learning in this course, basic economic principles, those things we derive just by thinking through the implications of the fact that there are purposeful beings out there who have goals or preferences and they're using their reason to try to achieve their ends, to, to steer reality the way they want it to unfold. That there's a lot you can unpack just from that initial axiom, and it's precisely that kind of knowledge that we're going to get. And it really is knowledge. You're learning more about reality by going through these exercises. By the time you're done with this course, you will know a lot more about the real world than you did at the start. Just like when you take a geometry course, at the end of it, you know a lot more about reality than you did at the start of the course, even though the professor is not going to give you a bunch of results and say, mathematicians have done these experiments or run these observations for the last 300 years, and we're pretty sure that this is all true, and let me just summarize this knowledge and give it to you. That's not what's going to happen in a math class. And yet, even though you're just going to think through things in math, there's a sense in which when you're done, you will walk away knowing something important about the world. And the same thing here, that if I do my job properly, and I hope that you are motivated by it and excited by it, you will walk away with a superior understanding of the real world, even though the kind of things we're going to learn in this course are not verified by empirical observation or measurements, and they're certainly not subject to a, a test or an experiment that might falsify them. That's not the kind of knowledge I'm going to give you, but it is knowledge, and it is crucial for you to understand it. Thanks, everybody.